Good evening, everybody. We are live now. I request our secretary Madhusudan sir to start the program. Uh, thanks, Samtu. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, respected President Sir Boa, uh, all the panelists, moderator, all the Boa members, audience, and Ortho TV. You all are most welcome today in the webinar all about the meniscus. I hope it will be a very fruitful session. And I request our respected President Sir to say a few words. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of Bihar Orthopedic Association, it's an honor and privilege to welcome you all. Last week, the topic of webinar was all about ACL. And today, it is all about meniscus. It is quite interesting subject. In our everyday practice, we see various cases of knee injury, sometimes ACL injury alone, or sometimes associated with meniscus injury. ACL injury has got ACL injury has got very clear and elaborated guidelines for its treatment. But with meniscus injury, we have always been in dilemma that which meniscus should be preserved and which should be repaired or excised. This webinar is going to help in clearing all the doubts and this and thus is out our decision making in clear decision making and this will improve our knowledge skill and brilliance thank you now i hand over to dr sudip okay uh, good evening everyone thank you all for joining uh, here with us on this boa webinar on all about meniscus uh, i quickly introduce uh, all our uh, speaker here uh, Dr. Manish uh, is here, I think. Yes, Dr. Manish uh, will be speaking on anatomy and biomechanics of meniscus. Then Dr. Shivam Sinha from uh, the BHU will speak upon meniscectomy versus meniscal repair, when and how. Then uh, followed this talk will be followed by Dr. Rakesh Chaudhary, faculty at PMCH Patna by uh, bucket handle tear repair and resection. Then uh, the next three talks will be by one by Dr. Ramesh Prof on Dehradun, radial tear repair, video and presentation. Dr. Rajiv Raman, old friend and a very dear friend from Kolkata will be presenting on root repair and video technique. And uh, lastly, Arvind will be taking, Dr. Arvind from Paris HMRI Patna will be taking on ramp repair, video and uh, pictures. So yeah, and thank you all, uh, Dr. Madhusudan, Dr. Saraf sir, uh, Dr. Rajat Charan and uh, everybody else for joining. Thank you all for joining. So uh, all the panelists, I think uh, Gurudev, Rajiv Anand, sir, Neeraj Srivastav from Baranasi. Neeraj has already been here, I guess. Uh, Prabhat Prakash from Motihari. Sarthak from Bhubaneswar has joined. Uh, Vivek from Patna will be joining. Sergil Rashid from Patna will be joining. And Abhinash, my colleague at Ames Patna will be joining as well. So welcome you all. And uh, I request Dr. Manish to start sharing his screen. And uh, and we all will uh, follow our time, uh, ten to twelve minutes for our presentation, and we'll see if we can take our uh, take few questions in between two talks. We'll take, or if there are any uh, questions, uh, we will try and filter it out, and we'll pass it on to the speaker. So, Manish, Dr. Manish, the stage is all yours. Uh, your presentation is visible. Can, please go ahead. Yes. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Bo, for giving this opportunity to present a paper on anatomy and biomechanics of the menisci. A complex topic, but an important topic. At the same time, this topic can be a bit boring. Uh, see, I've tried to collect the data from various sources and present it here in a way as simple as possible. If you can spare 15 to 20 minutes of time, it might be beneficial to all of us. So let's start. So, Yes. So the, basically the menisci, they are discs of fibrocartilage which is interposed between the femoral condyle and the tibial plateau. The medial tibial plateau, as you can see, it is longer in the anteroposterior plane in comparison to the lateral tibial plateau. The central portion of the plateau, they are void and it represents the articular area. And the lateral meniscus plateau is almost circular and it is less concave. 
whereas the medial one is concave and then the superior surface of the lateral surface is not uh, very concave the menisci covers around two thirds of the, the peripheral two thirds of the tibia it deepens the articular surfaces and it stabilizes the joint the upper surfaces of menisci are concave whereas the under surfaces are flat peripherally the menisci thickens and it gets attached to the synovium and capsule Centrally, centrally, the border of the menisci, they are thin and it exists as a free edge. The length of the medial meniscus, that is around 3.5 centimeters. And the anterior horn of the medial meniscus gets attached to the tibial plateau, just anterior to the attachment of the ACL. And some of the posterior fibers from the anterior horn, it traverses and crosses the joint and gets attached to the lateral meniscus. And this is called the transverse ligament. The transverse ligament. The posteriorly, the medial meniscus is anchored to intraconal fossa, and then that lies between your PCL and the lateral meniscus attachment. And along its periphery, the medial meniscus is attached to the joint capsule and the deep MCL. And as far as the mobility is concerned, the medial meniscus is less mobile, whereas lateral meniscus is more mobile. Almost 10 millimeters of excursion is done by the lateral meniscus from flexion to extension. Here you can see the excursion of the lateral meniscus. The average excursion is around 11 millimeters. And the medial meniscus average excursion is around 5 millimeters. So as I already told you, the lateral meniscus is circular, covering larger portion of the articular surface. And as for the width of the anterior and posterior part, it is almost similar. The lateral meniscus, the posterior and the anterior part, their widths are similar. And the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus gets attached near the intracondylar spine, posterior to the attachment of the ACL. Here is the anterior horn of the lateral meniscus. Whereas the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus gets attached to the posterior intracondylar spine, which is anterior to the attachment to the medial meniscus. The lateral meniscus is not attached to the LCL, but it has got loose attachment or is loosely attached to the synovium along the much of its length. There are two ligaments, the anterior and posterior meniscofemoral ligaments, which are known as Humphrey and the Risbuck ligament, which lies or attaches from the posterior horn of lateral meniscus. It extends back and anterior and posterior to the PCL, it gets attached on the middle femoral condyle. Here you can see one of the meniscofemoral ligaments. The tendon of popliteus muscle, it, on its way to the lateral condyle, it crosses the joint through a hole in the lateral meniscus, and that hole is called the hiatus popliteus or the popliteal hiatus. This area along the popliteal hiatus, that is a avascular area. Here you can see some of the structures on the lateral, posterior lateral, the stabilizers of the posterior lateral area. Now, the vascular, vascular anatomy of the meniscus, it is relatively avascular, it having a peripheral limited blood supply. And the supply is by the superior and the inferior genital arteries. It forms a pre-meniscal capillary plexus and from there, radiating arteries or the radial branches extends inside the menisci, the radial branches. And as far as the penetration is concerned, the, on the medial meniscus side, around 10 to 30 percent of the periphery of the medial meniscus is penetrated by these radial branches, whereas on the later meniscus, it is about 10 to 25 percent. And one point to be noted that the vascularity of the outer thirds, the vascularity of the outer thirds, that is maintained almost throughout the life and very little changes with the age. The microscopic anatomy, if it is considered, the menisci are composed of water around 65 to 75 percent, collagen 20 to 25 percent, and the non collagenous substances, which comprises of proteoglycans, like um, uh, matrix glycoproteins and elastin, that comprises 5 percent. As far as the collagenous network is concerned, it is having a very complex orientation. The layers of the menisci, if they are considered, there are three layers, the superficial layer, lamellar layer, and the deep uh, central layer. The superior or the superficial layer, that is in contact with the tibial and the femoral articular surfaces. The fibers of collagen, they are very randomly arranged, 
and they are mixed with the lubricating layer of the proteoglycans, which allows them a low frictional surface. Beneath this superficial layer lies the lamellar layer. It has got an external area and an internal area. The external area consists of radially oriented collagen fibers, which intersects with the internal fibers at various angles, creating a mesh. The vertical fibers in lamellar layer projects into the projects into the central main layer, securing them together and also helps in the transmission of force between the two. In the central layer, the radially oriented fibers are known as the tie fibers. They can also integrate with the lamellar layer through perpendicular branches. The tie fibers holds the circularly oriented circumferential collagen fibers, which are found basically in the periphery of the central main layer. Now the tie fibers increases from anterior to the posterior region in its uh, numbers, which increases its stiffness. The circumferential fibers are larger bundles and comprises mainly of the type 1 collagen and majority of them are located in the internal and external circumference of the menisci. The radial tie fibers, the purpose of it is it resists the splitting of the circumferential fibers and it may contribute to the compressive properties of the menisci. The circumferential fibers undergoes a great tensile or hoop stresses when they are loaded axially. Now coming to the biomechanical properties of the menisci. The first and foremost property is its viscoelasticity. Uh, they are considered, the menisci are considered viscoelastic. What does it mean? It means that throughout an applied load, they exhibit two types of properties. One is viscous and the other is elastic. Now the transition between them is time, is the time dependent in nature. It begins with the elastic phase and then it shifts to the viscous phase while it is being loaded. So the elastic quality of the menisci or the solid phase of the menisci that is governed by your collagenous proteoglycan structure. Whereas the viscous or the fluid phase is due to the permeability and the water content of the menisci. Now what happens? Fluid is slowly extruded out. This accommodates the compressive load without excess deformation. And that lets the beginning of the viscous phase. And this is a very important characteristic of the tissue permeability. What happens, the important characteristic is that the fluid uh, through the interconnected pores between the solid matrix of the menisci and the synovial space, there has to be a clear permeability of the fluid from the solid matrix to the synovial space. Now, when it is compressed, the menisci is being compressed, under compression, the meniscal permeability determines the rate at which the fluid will be extruded out. This meniscal permeability is much lower in comparison to the articular cartilage, thus giving it the ability to maintain its shape during axial loads. And what happens during the gate phase, the gate, the stance and swing phase, especially in the, uh, the heel strike or the, the moment to the uh, stance phase, what happens? The menisci maintains their load bearing capacity and it resists the fluid loss and maintains its shape. If the menisci could not maintain their shape, that would be essentially a non functional menisci. The viscoelastic property of the menisci plays a role in the compressive resisting forces. Now, when the constant load is applied to the knee joint, the initial compression on the menisci that is resisted by the elastic property of the collagen bundle and matrix. Now, following this initial load, there is a diminished rate of compression when the fluid phase begins to take over. Now, as the fluid is extruded out, the compressive load is resisted, and this is called the creep. At this phase, the menisci relaxes, and the load needed to maintain that given held compression decreases. And this is known as the stress relaxation phase. So, the creep and stress relaxation phase is very important for the menisci. Now, as the compression force is applied, the circumferential tension develops, and this leads to the hoop stresses. 
the menisci gets extruded peripherally due to the wedge shape causing the radially oriented tangential force. Now, this peripheral extrusion is prevented by the anterior and posterior meniscal attachment, that is the anterior and the posterior root the attachment, the horns. The hoop stresses allows distribution of stress over a larger area of the articular surface. And this is an important function of the menisci where it is considered that it distributes the load that is due to the hoop stresses because it is getting distributed, the force is getting distributed. Now, the radial fiber. The, if, if, if there is a radial tear, this can disrupt the circumferential fiber and that can lead to the loss of the hoop stresses, resulting into a dysfunctional meniscus. Now, it is also said the posterior heart of the medial meniscus has got a higher aggregate modulus than the rest of the menisci. And maybe this is because, this may be because this region undergoes highest compressive stress and is most commonly injured site. Here you can see the axial load and which is getting transferred to the circumferential fibers through this radial tangential forces. Now the response to tension. What is the tension? Tension means it is the behavior of any tissue to the stretching force. And when the stretching force is applied, that the effect is elongation. So how much uh, resistance to elongation is there for the tissue? So that is called tension. So when the menisci undergoes tensile forces, the initially there is very little force needed to elongate the menisci because the collagen fibers are relaxed. Now after this uh, initial relation, the, after this there is a linear relationship between the elongation and the load applied. And after that there is a dip in the elongation where the fibers fails and it begins to tear. Now what is the, the maximum load which the menisci can bear? That is known as the ultimate tensile load. The tensile properties can change depending on the location of the menisci. In the superficial layer, there is no differences in the tensile strength. But in the deeper layers, the central, in the central uh, layer, that is the deepest layer, the circumferential fibers have got a greater tensile modulus than the tie fibers. Now, if the middle meniscus is considered, the highest tensile modulus lies in both the anterior as well as the posterior region. And studies have shown that the lateral meniscus, the reports are showing that the posterior part of the meniscus is having a higher tensile modulus, but other studies are showing that there is no difference between the uh, tensile modulus both in the anterior as well as the posterior region. In general, it is said that the menisci have got a, a tensile modulus of around 150 megapascals. ACL has got it around 200 to 300 megapascals. Polythylene has got 1,000 megapascals, and the radial fibers has got a mean of 11 megapascals. The last one is the response to the shear. Now, what is shear? Shear stiffness it gives the measure of the material's resistance to changing shape. The menisci have got low shear stiffness relative to cartilage, which is having almost more than uh, over more than 100 times more shear resistance. So the low shear stiffness allows the menisci to maintain an optimal congruency between the tibia and femur throughout the range of motion, thus ensuring even load distribution. Additionally, the tie fibers, it segregates the circumferential fibers. This also contributes to the low shear modulus of the menisci. Now, the shear modulus is found to be lowest in the posterior portion of the medial meniscus. Now comes the clinical biomechanics. So, what is the menisci functioning as? It is basically a spacer, like a spacer between the femoral and the tibial plateau, femoral condyle and the tibial plateau. The, if the menisci are removed, the amount of narrowing that can be there, that would be around one to two millimeters. The joint becomes very close to each other. And if the lateral meniscus is taken now, the consequence is much bad in comparison to the extension of the medial meniscus. Now, during extension, zero degree of extension, among 50, about 50% 50 of the compressive load is transmitted through the meniscus in zero degree of extension, which increases to around 85% when it is at 90 degree of flexion. And the meniscus increases the contact area 
to around 2.5 times. Uh, Dr. Manish, sorry, uh, I request you to uh, quickly wind up uh, the presentation in next uh, one or two minutes, if possible. Okay. How long is just, this left? Last yeah, just three, three, okay. Just okay. Three, okay. Just three, four slides. Okay. Okay. Quickly wind up, please. Yeah. I already told you this is a very boring topic. <laughs> <laughs> the lateral meniscus, the, about the range of movement, if you can see, the range of movement is around 10 millimeters in the AP direction. And this mobility is explained by the close attachment of the anterior and posterior arms. And there's a lack of attachment of the capsular ligament on the posterior lateral aspect. Where the medial meniscus is more firmly attached to the tibial condyle by the deep MCL, while the lateral meniscus is relatively mobile. And this can be one factor which makes medial meniscus a more important stabilizer. As the, as the knee flexes, the menisci moves posteriorly. And during extension, the menisci are pulled forwards by the meniscopatellar fibers, which are stressed by the anterior movement of the patella, and this draws the transverse ligament forwards. Whereas the posterior horn of the lateral meniscus is also pulled anteriorly by the tension developed in the meniscofemoral ligament as the PCL becomes taut. The medial meniscus shares around 60% of the weight of the medial compartment. Lateral meniscus shares 70%. The larger contact area is provided by the menisci, which reduces the average contact stress by between the joint surfaces. Even if we remove around 15 to 34% of menisci, this can increase the contact stress by around more than 350%. The medial contact area reduces by 20% after removing 50% of the posterior segment of middle meniscus and which can uh, lower down to 54% after total meniscectomy. The middle contact stress increases from 24% after 50% meniscectomy and 134% after total meniscectomy. After total lateral meniscectomy, the result can be 45 to 50% reduction in the total contact area and 235 to 335% in, uh, percent increase in the peak local contact stress. The peak contact stress is directly proportional to the amount of the meniscus removed. Now, there is a condition called PCL meniscectomy. What is that? What is that? That happens during PCL ruptures, there is an increase in the posterior tibial translation, which leads to uh, the loss of the weight-bearing portion of the meniscus being out of the uh, low transmission area. So that is not able to bear the weight and that is considered as PCL meniscectomy. So lastly, finally we come to what is the basic function of the menisci. So it acts as shock, shock absorption, load transmission, secondary restraint, role in proprioception and joint lubrication. Once the menisci were considered to be vestigial tissue. So what can be the take home message? The take home message is the tissue was, which was once considered to be vestigial has been proven to be very important. Very difficult to replicate or duplicate the function of menisci provided by the nature. So hence, think twice before removing even a small piece of meniscus until unless it is absolutely essential. And if you can't make the situation better, do not do further harm. Primum non nocere. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Dr. Manish. Uh, thank you very much. So, if there are any question, uh, we'll uh, take a, a question before the next slide by Shivam, Dr. Shivam Sinha. He will load up his screen and load up his slides. And uh, I would re I'd welcome also Dr. Bhushan Bhushan Sabnesh, the very good friend. He's uh, my co-moderator in this uh, session here. Welcome, Bhushan. And uh, Bhushan works in sports med and. Mumbai and uh, he's a very well known figure throughout the India for his sports injury work, arthroscopy work. He does a lot of arthroscopy, meniscus, ACL, and ACL, PCL, and corrective osteotomies as well. So he's a very well known figure, and we look forward actually whenever he's in a webinar, I tend to make it a point to <laughs> see. So, any questions, uh, Bhushan, uh, uh, or anything you want to emphasize? What are your indications when you take a uh, Think about removing any meniscus. I so, think, it, I, yeah. So Go what ahead. what Dr. Manish did was really brilliant. It was a really good talk, and it really brushed up a lot of uh, issues about uh, biomechanics, uh, the basic biomechanics, as well as the uh, effect of meniscus in, in saving the joint as such. 
there are two things which are important. Of course, we'll come to that in the next talk about meniscal excision versus repair. We need to be careful about which menisci can be saved and which can be excised. I think the next talk will be much more uh, in detail about that. But uh, we all know whatever we can save is fantastic. But uh, be careful about jumping the bandwagons uh, and trying different repairs. So uh, I've seen people trying to repair spaghetti menisci with, with very, very bad results. So just be careful. Case to case, we have to decide that next talk. Will... So it's always better individualize the treatment about based on the patient's status, the requirement of uh, uh, the, the, the actual tear. But excellent talk. Thanks. Okay, so so I think uh, more light uh, will be thrown on this by Dr. Shiva. Uh, Dr. Shiva, yeah. Mr. it's all yours. Please go ahead. I, um, I just want to... Okay. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yeah, sir. Audible. Your slide is also okay. visible and you are quite audible. Please yeah. go ahead. Uh, can, uh, I, can I proceed? Yes, yes. Proceed, yes. proceed, please. Uh, so I, I at the outset, I want to thank the Bihar Arthroscopy Society and Bihar Orthopedic Association for organizing this webinar on all about meniscus and the a topic which I have been given to talk on is about meniscectomy versus repair, when and how. I'm thankful to Dr. Manish for making my job much easier by giving a very good overview about the anatomy and functions. And we'll be walking through about the pattern of injury repair techniques, clinical results, decision making, and current recommendations. So anatomy has been well spoken of. We know that lateral meniscus is more articular and has more coverage and is, uh, both of the meniscus are periphery vascular. Patterns, I'm not talking about the patterns uh, or the mode of injury on which the treatment has to be individualized, whether it is traumatic, degenerative. The most common in traumatic one is about ACL injury with uh, vertical longitudinal tear patterns, which usually heals well. And degenerative, mostly in the older people, which are common horizontal cleavage types, may heal poorly. Ramp lesions, uh, new entities being discovered and uh, they are difficult to visualize and root tears are something which warrants attention. Figure shows about the classification of the root tears, which will be talked later. The repair concerns whenever we are taking for the repair that uh, certain points are always being researched and uh, taken care that what is the location of the tear in terms of a red, red or a red white zone? What is the configuration? What is the anatomy of the repair? Whether it is a horizontal tear, whether it is a complex tear, whether it is a parallel beak, all depend upon the type of fibers which have been disrupted and the extent which is involved. What is the complexity of the repair? How old the repair is? And other thing which is an important factor is the patient's age and compliance. Another thing which we usually see about the knee stability and knee alignment. So these are the concerns when one is contemplating for a repair. The typical indication which has been taught to us and what we usually do is to go for an acute tear with, of meniscus, which is traumatic, mostly vertical longitudinal, having a length somewhere between one to four centimeters and peripheral zone. Uh, red, red zone are more important in a young patient with a stable well aligned knee. So the techniques we usually opt, which are, uh, I'm talking of arthroscopic techniques, like outside in, inside out, and all inside. In the outside in, that uh, once the tear is identified uh, through transillumination, a suture is passed from outside, retrieved, passed across the meniscus, and is tied over the capsular structures so that meniscus is opposed and reduced. And this is suitable for repair of anterior and middle third of the meniscus. The inside out is more of a gold standard. We usually practice much and usual use speci specialized cannula, like zone specific cannula. And the suture is passed from inside and depending upon which and, uh, meniscus we are dealing with, whether it is a medial and lateral, according to the anatomy, the neurovascular anatomy, incision is made and the suture is again tied so that the meniscus tear is reduced. It is mostly apt for the tears of posterior and middle third of meniscus. All inside is the new technique, but mostly reserved for the posterior horn tear. And the four generation repair devices, they allow for placement of sutures in the meniscus and then self-adjusting and sliding knots are applied so that meniscus is reduced. Medial meniscus, posterior horn, they are more important as told in the previous lecture because it bears most of the commercial strength. So what clinical results till now we have obtained based on the technique, whatever technique you're using, the technique is uh, 
about 70 to 95 percent success rate. When you do for a second look scopy, you find that the success rate has lowered either because the, the pattern of the choice of the tear which was chosen was not correct or the tear has not healed. It has reduced to 45 to 70 percent. Overall, five five year survivor ship for an isolated meniscal repair ranges somewhere between 60 to 70 percent. Factors which affect maybe more like complex tear, rim wind, and many other factors which are affecting the outcomes. Ligament laxity is not addressed, then the repair is likely to fail and success rate further drops down. And the success rate in conjunction with ACL tear when ACL reconstruction is contemplated, and at the same time, meniscal tear is a result can be as good as 90 90%. What is dilemma which is based on the evidence? We know that there is a higher functional outcome in repair, but as for literature, Baxter et al., there is a higher reoperation rate as well. There is a limited success in certain tear patterns like central tears. There is a longer rehabilitation and sportsmen might miss their present season. But in the study by Steen et al., the long-term result to the return to sport is as high as 96% as long as the eight years follow. What if you do meniscectomy? It affects the hoop stresses, it reduces them, but the result depends upon how much you are resecting it. As told, if you resect more, the tibiofemoral contact pressure increases more. And that is the reason an early onset degenerative joint disease is seen, but it may not be symptomatic as late as by 16 years. They can keep on working, but X-rays might not look good or MRI might not look good. Technically less demanding and a shorter rehab is there. So what are the tools what surgeons usually have in deciding what they look? The present knowledge, what standard indications are, and the intro of findings. And we have also some MRI-based speculations or predictions. And this is one of the tools which recently have been published in 2019 by alumni from our institute, our MKSSTA, that uh, they are taking, and this is all known as ortho and prompt score from uh, ortho and hospital. They are taking criteria like age, chronicity, and X-ray features of uh, the osteoarthritis along with the zone of tear and pattern, and they are assigning the scores. As the score rises, chances of meniscectomy is increasing, and as the score is less, less than six, meniscal repair is contemplated, and it is predicted. With this, with this scoring, they could find from their study that uh, almost for medial meniscus, which is less mobile and more likely to retail, their sensitivity for Repair is about 91%. That means if they have planned a repair on the MRI finding, similar repair they can do post uh, mm -hmm. intraoperatively. And specificity is 93%. However, for lateral meniscus, the predictability is reduced. Uh, there are 69% sensitivity and 79% sensitivity is for meniscectomy. So what are the contraindications? Very long tear, we are going to excise it. Central radial tear, less than even 25% involvement should not be touched. Central avascular zone tears, complex, radial, flap, cleavage, all type of maybe maybe better discarded in meniscectomy can be done. Degenerative meniscal tear articular cartilage in the ipsilateral compartment is in contradiction. Most important thing is an irreducible tear. Tear which you are trying to reduce and is not reducing and you have fixed it in an unreduced position. This is going to land up in a fuss later. Unstable knee and older non-compliant patients are contraindications to it. And this is what uh, the editorial of KSSTA by experts of median has talked in 2020 in their second consensus regarding traumatic meniscal tear. They have generally agreed upon preserving the meniscus whenever possible. And they have said that meniscal pathologies like ramp lesions, root tears have high incidences than expected. And once visualized, they should be repaired regardless of the age. The risk benefit for using biologics like PRP and growth factor is yet to be researched and it's an open arena. Degenerative tears, horizontal, complex, extending in the avascular zone, need are becoming an extended indication of repair because as the tear will be less be addressed, more degeneration will continue. So tear has to be addressed by something as amenable for repair. And there is a concept of combined resection and repair. And this is the part which need to be conservative in resection and more towards repair. So the revised indications are like patient factors. Patient has to be active. 
age is just a number. The patient can be active, but has to be compliant, has to have a BMI less than 30 and no significant comorbidities there. Tear characteristics more or less remain the same, red zone, red, white zone, simple tear patterns, uh, an acute uh, tear associated with ACL reconstruction, but the most important thing that tear, whatever you are going to repair, it should be without existential. There is a lower threshold for complete radial tear, root tear, and amp lesions, which we will see in the upcoming videos by our next speakers. So the current recommendations as the pendulum swings, and this is from the latest review, systematic review by Monal in 2019 published in EJOST that there is a limited data comparing between these two techniques because of absence of RCTs. Partial meniscectomy can be done wherever the repair is contraindicated and the tear is symptomatic. There's no consensus for ideal technique. You can use either of the techniques on any of the implant, but there is no difference in the outcome as early as five years. The learning curve is rising, so meniscal repairs are rising because awareness for meniscal preservation is increasing. Focus is to save as much as possible. The most reliable technique is by placing vertical divergence sutures almost every four millimeter along the length of the tear. So length of the tear is no more an indica uh, contraindication. Indication has been extended to any age, which is having root tear, ram tear, and uh, the patient has to be active and compliant. And the longer rehabilitation period in repair, as well as a chance of reoperation has to be explained to the patient. Operative. Excellent, Shivam. Very nice talk, Shivam. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So, there are no live questions, but uh, can we have some discussion over here? Because I think this, yeah, yeah. this is the most important uh, talk so that when to repair is the most important thing right now because most of the failures which we are seeing in our practice of the repairs are because of the wrong indications what I have felt, you know, irreparable tears. So one important question which would I would like to ask with Dr. Shivam, what is the timing, time duration under which the patient will come and you will repair? So you say as acute the tear is and what are the concomitant pathologies you are doing to deal with if there is an ACL reconstruction, mute ACL, you are reconstructing the ACL, you try and attempt uh, to repair, uh, see the reduction of your tear. As the tear is reducible, you repair at the same time. So any time and and if you see that tool, what I was talking of, the ortho one from tool, huh. they have taken the duration as late as up to within one year. One year. And if you see the revised indications, they say it is better if you intervene early, maybe three months. The more important part in dealing with meniscal tear is isolated meniscal repair. They still have a higher reoperation rate. You might have land up doing a second look arthroscopy and do a meniscectomy. But when you are dealing it with an ACL tear and then you are repairing the meniscus, the chances of healing is much better. So now my second question, which I was about to come. So when right. we are repairing the ACL, we are getting uh, stem cells. That is the reason it heals better. Correct. So uh, no, may not be. You no, are getting they are, they are ACL. That, that you are the, reducing the translation as well. And the that, translation is also dependent on the meniscal translation, which is anti no, But in isolated tear, in, in, which, in which there is no ACL tear, in that there is no translation. But the reason why it is healing better with an ACL reconstruction is because we are getting stem cells. That's why many, many papers are there that we should put PRP also. Many people are putting primary PRP also with meniscal to improve the outcome. Correct. So, uh, and uh, one more thing, uh, what about the uh, the uh, age, any age limit or alignment issue also you are looking if you're planning to repair a meniscus? Yeah, definitely. The age is uh, what uh, the recent meeting has said in ESCA that the patient has to have two things. He has to be lean and thin, he has to be active, and he has to be compliant to your post-op protocols. Right. Uh, if you start uh, loading your repair or your repair is not properly reduced, that is one of the technical failures. In ACL, we know that if the tunnel placement is not properly, it is going to land up somewhere into a failure. Similarly, for many sky, 
when they are not reduced and you have attempted that this implant might reduce it and let me do it and that mm, that, 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 that is just that, to hold it that is just to just create a havoc later and that would land up in a uh, reoperation right. and about the alignment issues yes definitely you know the sir has explained very nicely regarding the hoop stresses and the tensions and the mm. translation this all depends how femur and tibia are uh, correlating each other during the flexion and extension and similar at that time your menisci and your repair are also adjusting along the alignment and various surfaces of both the articular cartilage on both the sides Actually, if they are like not conforming just... it and alignment is not proper then your uh, your repair is kind of at a jeopardy other experts may also point bhushan yeah. sir yeah so uh... Yeah, I agree with most of the discussion that we have. That actually brings it brings us perfectly about what I wanted to ask. So, someone, let's say a 20, 22 year old uh, athlete comes to you with a isolated meniscal tear, let's say lateral meniscus. We are going to repair it for sure. What are the chances you are going to put something else apart from the meniscus repair? So, the reason I'm asking you is you just mentioned PRP. Yeah. Uh, what about stem cells? What about fibrin clot? What about uh... fibrin clot also? I, I was actually coming to this question only because many things are being added on to just so, yeah. enhance the, especially when you are doing the red white zone or the yes, white sir. white zone. Yeah. So what I was trying to ask is uh, of all the uh, all, all the panelists and speakers, what is the opinion about adding something more to an isolated meniscal tear repair? So Raji, yeah. we are now, going we are going ahead now with radial tear repair as well so what do we need to do to allow that meniscus to heal better enhancement yes so yeah. Raji, go ahead. yeah yeah i think biological augmentation is must and if, uh, for me isolated meniscus tear i do some uh, microfracture in the intercondylar notch so that there is uh, bleeding from the intercondylar notch again needle technique is very predictive technique and a very effective technique where you can put your needle from outside in multiple puncture and that usually uh, proliferates the vascular channel for uh, meniscal healing. And third most important is PRP or clot, uh, 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 fibrin clot, when we put fibrin clot. But I think that is very technically demanding. For beginners, I think intercondylar now, microfracture and needling is the best technique they can do. To Even cost effective, I would say. Even cost effective. Cost effective and a... Uh, it's not very technically demanding. Also. Reproducible very easily. Okay. Achha, one, one more about the alignment. Bhushan, what you have to speak about alignment, like degenerative tears and root tears. Many people say that you should repair and then do an STO. Many people are just doing STO. It will heal by its own. Yeah, you have already taken my trump card out of the pack immediately. I was going yeah, to leave so it till the end. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, so, just so, the yeah, indication. Yeah, see, because... So, uh, Rajiv, is there any the role of synovium for, uh, yeah, as the... for regeneration of menisci after repair? Sudip, just one at a time, we are getting confused. Okay. Yeah, no, I think all these things will come up. Uh, it will uh, come up. Yeah, sure. will, it will yeah. definitely come up. So I think let's I think on, on HTO, we can have a special session with Dr. Yeah. Bhushan. He has a very nice talk on HTO. Arvind, we can invite Dr. Bhushan for one session on HTO. Maybe next. Maybe next. We can plan. Yes. Yeah. Sure, sure, so, sure. can we go back to Dr. Rakesh Chaudhary? Can you sir, start sharing your screen and uh, take it, uh, take us through your talk on bucket uh, tears, meniscectomy, and repair? Uh, thank you very much. Hope I'm audible to you all. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, it's thank you, Sri. Uh, yeah. Uh, hopefully, most many of the Things which will be I talk, talking about is on bucket handle meniscal tear and repair would be repetitive for with Shivam because it is also a part of a meniscal injury and the indication most of the indications and the other things remains the same. Uh, this is mostly for the repair at, just because there was some uh, mix up for the topic of uh, I just had to talk on meniscal injury that's why I have added a small video of uh, resection also. So basically this slides will be on the meniscal repair is nothing uh, new on the 
the first uh, meniscal repair was re uh, done by ikichi in tokyo in 1979 it is nothing new uh, the largest study of uh, meniscal repair was by scott and jelly 178 repairs in 167 percent and almost he gave a result of 80 percent of them healed uh, the best result as we all know already told are obtained when it is associated with uh, acl reconstruction when the rim width was less and the repair was done early within 8 week of the injury so always good to do in the red red zone not to go beyond the 50% of the part so best repair to be done and we have to see that it is in the red red zone the important thing is why should we do it we should do it because it restores the function maintains the load transmissibility minimizes contract stresses and it contributes to the stability and also as a helps in chondro protection but then should every tear be repaired if it is so much uh, uh, good thing to do no appropriate and informed decision is required and almost 20% is only repairable not all of them so literature the success rate if there is a inverse correlation between the uh, success rate and rim width the tear length the patient is the more the age the more, less the success rate the mean stability and the bmi the heavier the patient less is the success rate but still the success rate of various authors have been over uh, 75% almost 80% most of them one has to consider the repairability the geometry and the technique what we have in hand the healing potential the exact place and the time of the how old the injury is yet there is the any associated surgery which we need to do and have to consider the recovery time with it and the patient preferred outcome and concern how much is he ready to commit to your uh, repair protocol is important so the ideal tier to repair i sorry it is going to be repetitive a bit uh, patient less than 40 year traumatic meniscal tear recent tear associated with cruciate collateral ligament longitudinal tear within 3 to 5 mm from the menisco capsular junction and a stable knee one should avoid repairing and chronic complex tears degenerative tears unstable knee without if you have not done reconstruction and uh, associated gait for osteochondral defect is already there this is a study which says takes into consideration various location age size of the tear tissue quality and other things and gives a specific point and repair on this repair is indicated if the score is less than 4 so very precise and actual where we should go for a repair or where we should wait but there has been a recent surge in the repair that is true everybody knows that and we are all doing it why because early diagnosis due to better imaging technique is not available to all of us early treatment is sought by the patient for acl reconstruction and many of the meniscal repair are done while we are doing the acl reconstruction better instrumentation and more in fixation options are now been available various technique as we discussed by dr shivam i won't go into inside outside in technique for the anterior third inside out technique for the middle third ideally all inside technique for the posterior third it is ideal but you can mix and match as you per you comfort i won't go into this inside out and outside in technique because already well well explained by the um, previous speaker so let's go into what we do a very simple case of a bucket handle tear we do a diagnostic arthroscopy and we see a tear we see a tear which is almost at the capsulo meniscal junction a fresh tear because the fibrillation are still there we look at it it and we take certain points we shave and now certain points are being there to increase the vascularity of that place we take out all the debris from that point but we do a rasp it again something like which you trephanization you can do it by needle by here it is all done to increase the vascularity at that point important 
the meniscus should be reducible before we go for it we reduce it and measure the distance of the meniscal edge from the capsule and then through a guide we take the meniscal repair system it has a built in uh, anchor with a fiber wire inside it with a sliding long it side as already explained by dr shivam and we place the anchor goes beyond the capsule we measure it from behold so it should the needle should not go very very far distance it is all marked we have to go till that distance only once we put the two anchor and then we it has got us not there and we pull on it as we pull the meniscus the medial part goes towards the periphery peripheral part and it is a very stable kind of a fixation when we do for a second similar thing and normally if it is a bucket handle tear minimum 3 of them are needed for a stable very costly for a person like me working in a government hospital setup difficult for me to get this off the shelf uh very costly the markings are there you have to very careful you don't just shoot through and coming out of posterior so you can see as we tighten it goes there so repair being done the success rates for all the techniques most of the them are approximately 70% second look shows a bit lower ligament laxity decreases the success rate to almost 30% uh 90% success rate if done with conjunction with acl reconstruction this is for all repair technique is not only for the what we need to do for enhancing healing remember we can do trephanization synovial abrasion rasping of the tear edges fibrin cord prp just was there in the discussion nothing new we all know about it many of the time we are able to do it many of the time we are not important the rehabilitation part because it's take a longer than a excision thing of thing daily icing and elevation weight bearing as tolerated with crutches hinge rehab brace fixed with full extension for 4 weeks gait assessment and rehabilitation no resistor knee extension and high impact for twisting activity for no high impact twisting activity for 4 months uh the take home messages for here would be the visualization and portal placement with a spinal needle is very important you should locate your uh, uh, places where you are going to put a needle beforehand you should not struggle with it thorough site preparation and debridement and rasping access geometry of the tear provisional reduction reduce it first it should be re still re reduced then you you go ahead and do the repair accessory accession incision proper retractor if needed should be done select a repair device and method that optimizes the tear pattern and individualize the rehab patient just last because i have been told bucket held tear i will give you a very small video about uh, resection also uh, how to do a bucket held tear resection 
you do a diagnostic arthroscopy, you go inside and see the bucket and repair. So before doing the resection, it should be reduced, becomes easier to cut the meniscus once it is reduced. Cut the posterior on attachment first, but just don't completely take it off, share it off. Just leave a couple of fibers so that once you it should be you should be able to pull it off even when attached. If need, just change your uh, scopes, uh, vision uh, port and the working port as much as you want, whenever you want. Cut it. Once you have taken, there would be a few small segment attached here from the base, which you can easily shave it off. And thus it is. You do a relook, and if there's no fragment, it is done. Thank you very much. It was nice, sir. Oh, thank you. So, which device you use for repair? A uh, fast fix uh, from uh, uh, Smith and Okay, so it was all uh, different. I, I, I don't uh, exactly remember, but most of most of the time I use fast fix from the Smith and Okay, so it was not the single device which we put all the three. It was different different devices for all the three anchors. <laughs> okay. I think the first one was sequent from Convert, which has five. That's what, yes. that's what I. I was because he had put two yes. uh, stitches with the same device. Convert is coming up to five stitches you can put. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Five and seven. Two uh, the same. Yes. Most of the time, I am. Most of the time, I'm using the Smith and Nephew one. So uh, thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'll request Dr. Ramesh Gaur to load up his presentation. And uh, since there are no questions on online questions, so quick questions to all of you till Ramesh loads up his presentation. Is that uh, uh, when considering time since injury, uh, does it also depend upon the age and does it also depend upon the zone of injury? So time, zone and age, how different speaker, panelists and members present here would uh, take their case to case basis, uh, decide upon repairing or excising the meniscus, depending upon time since injury, age of the patient and zone of the injury. So do you have any, any guideline in your mind before you go ahead? Uh, Arvind, can you uh, take this on? So uh, when I started doing meniscus repair almost seven years back, I usually keep rule of four in my mind. The rule is four. First is the age should be less than 40 years. Second, it should be less than four weeks of duration. Third, lesion should be in the four millimeter from the periphery so that it should be in the red zone. Okay. The four one is the stitches distance. If you are putting the vertical uh, stitches, that is taken as the strong stitches, particularly for the bucket handle type of tear. Then it should be four millimeter apart. Then it should be four week of non bed bearing. And till four week, only 90 degree of movement should be done, not more than that. And patient will return to the heavy activity on other thing after four months. Okay. So this is the basic standard thing no, I, I started. I wanted a short and sweet answer which you have given. Very nice. Rule of very, it very, was, very crisp answer. Neeraj, you take on this. Uh, yeah, I, I would agree with uh, almost all the points with uh, Arvind. Even I am a little, uh, you know, uh, not very aggressive on repair because 
okay. we have so, to I we have to quick, quick answer on uh, okay considering it has to be it has to be red zone okay red white only if it's a professional athlete or very high demand patient okay if i'm uh, repairing uh, even uh, ligaments then i would be more keen to go for uh, meniscus repair and i keep knee for extension for four weeks this is the only one point i would uh, differ with arvin right. okay. i keep extension for four week i allow rm only after four weeks i, I, will, I will include two more people before we go on to the next talk rajiv you first and then uh, if uh, bhushan could give us his insight after rajiv quickly what is his consideration when you go for a repair or you excise so rajiv quickly you it should be a protective rehab i think uh, we should not be no, as no, aggressive as when you as... consider uh, repairing uh, so time since injury yeah, definitely uh, it's the age of the patient quality of the tissue and time of the year uh, for me i think after 3 months usually it's not a right time and the most important clinical finding is when you put your scope inside if you see the medial border is rounded and it's meniscus is irreducible don't repair those meniscus because i think you will burn out your finger yeah, that is what i know will i see so Sinovial. Yes, sinovialized meniscus. Sinovialized meniscus. Uh, Bhushan, quickly, can so, you give your insight? I think under the age of twenty, everything can be repaired because any bucket under under the age of twenty is disaster if you excise. So try and repair everything in under the age of twenty. I agree with Rajiv. If you have sinovialized meniscus, the signs normally are yellowing of the meniscal tissue and adhesions between the uh, displaced portion and the ACL or the PCL. There are bad signs. and i think over 3 months uh, uh, i won't try and venture into repair of the bucket yeah, yeah. so if the knee is locked for more than 3 months i think it's better to exercise better better okay so we have a great insight from a uh, few of the panelists and it actually it makes life easier for the listeners and the young practitioners when they are deciding till they till that till a the time they make up their own minds so, okay all yours uh, ramesh uh, please go ahead and present your uh, visible uh, and I am audible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you are audible, and it's quite visible to us. Thank. Go ahead, please. So at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, Bihar Arts Copy Society and my old friend Arvind for giving me this opportunity. Uh, meniscus repair, as we all know, though it has been done for quite some time, but uh, it has caught up quite recently when all these design devices came up, and when we started recognizing that the results are much better if we repair them timely. out of all the tears probably the uh, bucket handle tears we have seen for quite a long time the radial tears were probably the thing which we all were afraid of why because uh, if we leave it the results are different. repairing them was not not uh, never very easy why because in the uh, excellent presentation the first presentation that we had the circumferential hoop stresses that actually prevent uh, the meniscus from collapsing from extruding once a radial tear happens those hoop stresses they create havoc inside the knee and the meniscus literally if you don't repair it or in in case you cannot repair it you remove it the meniscus is probably uh, going to create other changes also cartilage change it can be a small tear to begin with and it progresses gradually if it's not uh, taken care of and finally uh, the final outcome might be a parrot beak tear or a complex tear repair of uh, meniscus radial tear specifically we all started with the normal uh, horizontal sutures as we do with bucket handles as we have seen uh, uh, previously then a uh, paper came which said uh, the cross stitches if we take it in this x pattern they are much more uh, uh, they are much stronger as compared to the parallel stitches and finally uh, something like uh, a combined thing came up which is kind of a rip stop design so that your stitches they don't come out even if the patient uh, bears load on them so these are uh, many studies my uh, presentation is basically a video presentation and uh, some of the videos are not mine i have uh, borrowed it from smith and nephew website for the purpose of clarity because they, these are really good videos and they show exactly how to approach these tears so starting with identification of the tear here we are going with the horizontal sutures which has been done from time in memorial so what you do is we have taken these we have already taken uh, i'm sorry we have already taken these uh, stitches so we the device that we can use to take these stitches is uh, there's a specific device from uh, smith and nephew which is called a novo stitch which is some some something like a uh, expressio or the scorpion that we use for cuff repairs 
so you go inside you uh, bite you the, the needle comes up the thread comes out you take two stitches on both the sides then you pass your if you want to use the fiber wire you can use a fiber wire or you can use a normal uh, if you have an athi one if you are comfortable with it the patient with any any kind of uh, thread that you want to use and you you can take a horizontal stitch with that i i have uh, exactly how we take the stitches i have that uh, in the video so this is the device comes up and the sutures come up then you take the second suture before these devices it was not very easy to do these things uh, you could have done as uh, uh, we have already seen outside in repair inside out repair but radial tears are most of the times in the middle and body so they are not very easy to approach from outside so all inside with these uh, novo stitch and other, de other devices it has actually become uh, uh, quite convenient to repair these so this is the second horizontal stitch taken uh, there is an animation on the left side where you see how these stitches come up finely and this will recreate the circumferential uh, tension forces uh, this won't the, the hoop stresses are restored and uh, there won't be any further uh, enlargement of the tear and it won't progress to a bird beak tear or a large complex tear so this is what we were talking about initially it was a radial tear and it progressed posteriorly and then along the capsular margin in the red red zone it it uh, came off like a beak that's why it's called a parrot beak tear these type of tears how they are different because uh, you have to convert them first thing that you have to do is you have to stitch the horizontal surface into the capsular margin and then finally you make it into a radial tear and then reduce the radial tear as as you uh, did earlier the second thing that can be done is you reduce the uh, radial tear first in the same way as we already demonstrated with the use of novo stitch or if you have your shoulder devices with you you can use them also and then you uh, the complete thing can be uh, fixed to the capsule as we do with the bucket handle tears so parrot back parrot beak tears though uh, uh, as we we discussed uh, what meniscus should be repaired if they are repairable then only we should attempt these because if it's an old tear with synovialized tissue i don't think there's any point uh, doing these things so so initially the parrot beak the horizontal portion was repaired to the capsule and then in the same way that we did the earlier repair the beak is then being sutured to the uh, uh, to the horn part to the part which is there so the second stitch goes in the main body from the beak then with your uh, and then you take your knots and the meniscus reduces so the purpose here is to recreate the uh, proper anatomy to the best of whatever you can sometimes the repair in these especially these complex tears it might not be anatomical but if you can restore that tissue that uh, shock absorbing uh, mechanism and if you can uh, the hoop stresses can be uh, it can be the, the after the repair if the meniscus can withstand all the load that uh, that occurs on the uh, on uh, when we put a uh, tensile load on it then your job is done then you pr uh, pr probably prevent uh, arthritic changes in the future so this is the final stitch being taken i'll just forward it a little bit so this is another parrot beak tear so you check whether the uh, how far how long is the tear so that you can in your uh, you you know what exactly you have to do you can uh, think about the kind of repair the type of repair that you want to do in this patient then you freshen up the edges and once the uh, edges are freshened up then you go forward with the with your repair so this is the novo stitch that i was talking about
the suture is taken and the knot is being put once the knot is secured the meniscus falls back into its normal anatomical position the second stitch is uh, this is the all inside implant this is uh, whatever you want to use fast break sequent there are so many available now or depumitex uh, implant is also good so another uh, suture can be taken by that and finally with the novo stitch again you reduce the whole thing to the capsular margin so in these kind of complex tears especially it's very difficult to maintain the normal anatomy so even though there is slight overlapping there but probably this is this is still better than removing the whole meniscus if it's a young patient and maybe uh, the nature takes its course and some changes take place and uh, though the final uh, thing that is being done is to reduce to uh, make it a little inferior so that it doesn't impinge on the cartilage so you try your best in these complex tears you try your best to restore the anatomy but sometimes if you're not able to then maybe you can uh, you can be uh, uh, you can stay with a little less uh, anatomical repair but where you are sure that the hoop stresses are maintained and it's not the tear is definitely not going to progress even if the patient puts weight on it so this is the final repair though not anatomic but probably the patient uh, if you have you would have removed the menisci the patient would have been uh in more complications as compared to these kind of things. so this is not what we exactly want but this is something which we have to uh, we have to agree with finally because of the kind of tear that was there so radial tears as we all know uh, they are difficult tears to repair with with the kind of devices that we now have it's not uh, it's not that difficult as it used to be uh should be repaired because the hoop stresses you have to maintain them you have to uh, recreate the hoop stresses again otherwise it's going to damage the it's going to lead to arthritic changes later on and uh, once you repair the uh, post repair protocol is same as uh, we had with bicycle tears four weeks of rehabilitation and uh, the beautiful rule of four that uh, avin just now told i think this is all i have with the videos thanks a lot for your patient here thank you ramesh for a wonderful video presentation so uh, uh samshil i don't think there is any question coming up uh, on the forum uh, if i'm not wrong i'm also checking it uh yeah. i want to put a question yeah uh, so go ahead ramesh uh, this is dr shivam here so uh, dr. when when i was preparing for the uh, indications for the repair uh, there is a big dilemma about the contraindications in repairing the radial tear mm -hmm. now one the relative contraindication which i came across from an older paper was which was extending a radial tear extending in the periphery and the latest recommendations they are saying that the central radial tear you need not to repair so how do you decide uh, whether it is central radial tear or the radial tear which is extending peripherally when are you or every radial tear you are going to repair what what is your take i think it's it's very uh, closely related to the previous question also so what is the that one indication which guides you into repairing the meniscus so i think for me if the patient has come to me with any kind of tear i think unless it's a synovialized tear and unless i find it irreparable or if the if the body is such that i don't feel the repair would work if i find a good healthy meniscus there even if it's extending to periphery even if it's central i'm definitely going to repair it and i've i've never regretted that none of my patients has any had any difficulty even if i did those so for me if it's repairable tear with 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 a good quality meniscus not synovialized and amenable to repair i i go and i go forward and repair it uh, sivam boss the contraindication or relative contraindication for such type of tear that you have asked that uh, tear is extending to the periphery because the failure rate is very high initially but nowadays there is a lot of implant and technique has also changed the one recent technique is that for the radial tear particularly that extending to the periphery you just repair like you repairing the root of the meniscus you make the hole in the tibia 
make a tunnel there and pull that uh, both the fragment in through that tunnel so that your meniscus is not movable now and then you put the this uh, circumferential stitch or uh, this horizontal stitches and then again uh, the cross stitches also so initial contraindication because of lot of failure with this technique uh, the success rate is taken as higher side so until unless as dr ramesh has said it's not sanitized not degenerative mm -hmm. at the same time the biology of the knee any repair part should be considered along with all the cheese things that we discussed about the biology of the knee whether this knee is having healing potential or not many a time knee is arthritic then such type of knee is uh, the, the non biologic for the healing at the same time the biomechanics so biology and biomechanics should also be considered when you are dealing with the difficult meniscus for repair eg meniscus can be repair with no it is very good technique and very good implant but such type of difficult meniscus repairing should be these two factor also should be taken so ra radial tear if you don't properly align them they keep on tearing from the center towards the periphery and it yeah. puts you in soup because uh, each time you are not ready with the armamentarium to repair that what's important is that the difficult the, one a radial tear which goes all the way to the periphery is, is interrupting the uh, peripheral circumferential fibers mm -hmm. so there is also a role for selective resection and repair in these radial tears so uh, for is a golden uh, middle path for all of us here so if you feel that the pre border of the meniscus is not vascular not repairable you can just repair the peripheral part uh, in the red zone or even red white zone and resect uh, the central part into a smooth circular shape rather than having a pointed uh, crevice kind of arrangement right. uh, what arvin was mentioning was the lapra technique you can always there are lapra to come up with nice complex ways of repairing all right. all the Uh, structures in the knee so there's a there's a single or double tunnel technique available for repairing a root uh, repairing a radial tear as well slightly more complex than than usual but the downside of doing that is the meniscal mobility is restricted so we don't know the long term feasibility uh, of uh, uh, preventing a mobility of the meniscus versus giving the uh, biomechanical advantage that's something we need to look at so especially in I, the medial meniscus yeah so i don't know the just logically it does not sound that feasible to be yet other but yes i have seen the good results that they have mentioned but uh, i think uh, the peripheral part needs to be repaired with whichever way you can and in this uh, scenario you can do penetration you can do outside and inside of whatever technique you want and get a good repair done. so i'd like uh, all the panelists and speakers to throw some light upon uh, when you are dealing with lateral meniscus and when you are dealing with medial meniscus depending upon zone how you technique differs there so many things in the market so starting from you romesh so does it really differ when you are dealing with medial meniscus and lateral meniscus uh, anterior third and posterior third so can you quickly take on In in two terms. Technically, no, but the portals definitely you have to switch your portals accordingly. So if you are going for a lateral meniscus, you know which gives you the best approach with the fast with with whatever thing you are using, three sixty or sequent or whatever. Okay. And if it's an anterior hand tear, usually to reduce the cost, I go for an outside end technique. I don't go for the and and it's very difficult to use the uh, all inside technique there. for the body and posterior i don't think it makes a different technique wise but the portals definitely you need to uh, be wise enough to know which portal gives you the best uh, attachment the best repair sure excellent neeraj your take on this quickly actually uh, i i always try my best to repair lateral meniscus i struggle and struggle more because i want to save the lateral meniscus more than middle meniscus okay uh, rajiv your take Based on, on this. as uh, romesh has said okay rajiv radial tear i think any tear close to root i use like uh, most of the time i try to repair it but central part and anterior parts for me it's balancing okay arvin uh, most of the time i try to repair until unless biology is fine mm -hmm. and usually i put circumferential less stitches okay. that is the strongest stitch, stitch as uh, we all know that recently this uh, stitch novo has been introduced so i can show this uh, things that uh, 
I usually do if your permission is there. And that circumferential stitch uh, that so I, I when you're showing your video next because you are the next speaker. So you start. Dr. Raj, Dr. Rajiv is the next. So usually Sorry. I rely more on the stitches. Okay. So that it should not only the oppose the tissue, it should also give a strength to your suture, repairing suture, okay. so that your meniscus remain stay there mm -hmm. if your uh, range of motion and other part is going on. So okay. usually I try to uh, repair uh, all these meniscus until unless it's by no And Avinash, okay, you raise your hand. Avinash, go ahead. Regarding med medial meniscus repair and the lateral meniscus repair, you should have a very low threshold for medial meniscus uh, repair doing pie casting of MCL. Just doing, if you have a low threshold for pie casting, you always get, get a better vision of for the medial meniscus. It will more amenable for repair for beginners. So but don't hesitate in doing pie casting for a medial meniscus repair. What was really impressive about all the videos we have seen till now is that mm -hmm. none of the none of the surgeons have damaged the articular cartilage. I, mm -hmm. Whenever you are doing a meniscal repair, you always leave a signature of the surgeon on the articular cartilage. The articular cartilage. Stays there for life. So mm -hmm. all the videos are, are keenly looking whether there is any articular cartilage. I wish to point it out, but I've been I, I, I've been defeated very well. So I'm, I'm quite glad. So uh, pie crusting or no pie crusting, you need a good assistant. You need to make sure your joint is open and don't open the mouth of your instrument till the time you are you have reached the periphery of the meniscus. If you're using anything like a Novo stitch or a scorpion or, or a, a first pass, so you need to make sure that your instrument is not damaging the cartilage. The whole purpose of repairing the meniscus is to save the cartilage. If you save, if you damage the cartilage in the surgeon in the surgery itself, your whole purpose is defeated anyway. Okay. So, Nice word of wisdom. I feel it is. It is sometimes very important to do pie crusting. At least in my practice, sometimes it is very difficult to visualize. Yeah. Unless so, you have you. very, very, very good. Uh, like Bhushan is having a very good assistant. I, th I think I even I have seen him. He can open up any joint without pie, pie crusting. I think <laughs> they have never done pie crusting. I remember. Go to your presentation and Santak, you take. You were the uh, you were the last one to answer my question and uh, when well, your presentation will come up. Uh, well, I generally try to repair all uh, the meniscus, whichever I can, whether it's a posterior or mid-third body. Okay. Entry, as you know, goes from outer in technique. But for me, going ahead with the repair, I generally uh, take a proper, uh, you know, consultation with the patient. And I need to know exactly what the patient uh, mind is, which is very much important for me. I can go ahead and do a repair, but if the patient is not willing to go for a delayed rehab, and, uh, you know, the weight bearing, because sometimes you get certain people who are really can uh, create nightmare post stiffness and all they can come with the stiffness i prefer to keep that uh, uh, mm -hmm. balancing option quite open for with me sure. uh, as uh, i would go again with dr arvin who said that uh, mobilization to be start and to focus on uh, you know to get within four weeks uh, some mobilization uh, because yes even when i started my meniscus repair initially uh, i used to keep it for three to four weeks and i have seen patient come uh, the delayed rohm in compared to the patient whom I have started in two weeks with toe uh, touch weight bearing, they come with a good uh, range of movement later on. Okay, uh, fair enough. Okay, fair points, uh, Sartak. So all yours, Rajiv, go ahead and uh, show us yeah. uh, your uh, meniscal root avulsion video technique. Thank you, Team Viewer, for invitation. I think all the tier we have discussed, we may, may get in isolated manner, but meniscus root tier or abelian most of the time is associated with either a ACL, PCL or collateral injury because it's a severe injury to the knee which causes a root abelian or root tear. So just I will be discussing two types of root uh, repair technique, the medial meniscus root repair technique and the lateral meniscus root repair technique to a small video demonstration. So this was a 25-year-old athlete as a rotating injury of his knee and you can see when you put your scope inside there is a type 2 avalion of the root of the lateral meniscus you can see whole of the lateral meniscus are just hours from the root here and such type of tear is usually common when you have a excessive loading force and a rotational force acting over the knee so once you identify such type of tear the second important part is See for the condyle loss also. Some most of these tear are having associated condyle loss. If you put your scope inside, you can see there is around one centimeter square condyle loss. 
So there was a dilemma whether to go for something for this condal loss or just to repair this meniscus so that it can cover the this condal area. And if you search literature, up to one centimeter of condal loss in the tibial side, if it is covering, it's covered by meniscus. Most of the time, it heals well because this repair we keep them for protected wearing for six to twelve weeks. So by that time, you will have some hyaline cartilage formation there. So we thought we planned for meniscus root repair and. And nowadays we do it with through all inside technique. We have very good instrument suture passing device by which you can just uh, repair this meniscus. And here you can see the first and most important step is preparation of your tunnel. Most of this root avulsion, if you drill it in fresh, you will see a raw cartilage area, raw area there. So you don't have to prepare that area. So with the four millimeter drill bit, you make a drill over the posterior, uh, over the uh, anatomical location of the root and pass your suture loop through this four millimeter hole. You can see here through this bit pin, I'm passing my suture loop. So once your suture loop is passed, the second important step is park it in the anterolateral, uh, uh, in the anteromedial portal, one of your anteromedial portal. Now, once you have parked this loop, the second and most important part is taking bite through the root of the meniscus. And this is the first, sorry. So, what is important? So once you have, now you, yeah, yes, just. So now, once you have parked it in the uh, one of your anteromedial portal, take a bite through the root. Try to take bite through the mid substance of posterior part so that you have a good robust tissue inside. And always, always as Bhushan wrote, try to avoid making your signature over the articular cartilage. So whenever you are taking a bite, try to take, put your first pass mini device or suture passing device towards the uh, lateral gutter so that you are not damaging the cartilage. And this is a first pass mini self retracting device. Uh, and you can see here with this orthopod, I am taking this bite. And once you have taken bite through the root, then with your either a loop technique or with a not passing device, you can take two or three. You can see this is the not the passing device. You can four, make your four and five high pitches. And then the next step is passing of this suture through the tibial tunnel. And you can see here, once the yellow uh, uh, loop, which we have part in the lateral part, by you, you load this suture over the yellow, but you can see here, the whole of the meniscus is getting set well, uh, sitting well over. And you can see the whole of the articular loss, cartilage loss that was there over the lateral tibial condyle has been covered by the meniscus. And this is, I think, the all inside repair is a very good technique by which you can repair this lateral uh, or medial meniscus root avulsion. And now you can fix it anteriorly over the anteromedial aspect of the tibia, over the post or over the disc. And you can see, once I am pulling it, the whole of the meniscus is getting attached over the anatomical area. And that anatomical area should have enough raw surface so that is a good, good fibrous tissue uh, formation between the meniscus root and uh, the crater. The second video technique is this was an old meniscus root avulsion, you can see here. And here, the most important part is preparation of your character. So when you, are, when you see a neglected, a, a fresh injury, most of the time you have a raw area there. You don't need to prepare character. But when you are dealing with the old avulsion, you have to fix because up to six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks, whenever you see the meniscus, posterior horn of the meniscus is floating, you have to fix it. And this part is most important, preparation of your character. Why? Because whole of your meniscus will sit inside this crater and that is important that you should have a good helipad like area where the whole of the meniscus will sit and you will have good fibrous healing because if you put this meniscus over the cartilage there will be no healing of the root tissue so always always important the most important part is create a good crater here you can see i have removed almost one centimeter square of articular cartilage over the root area and now by the same technique with the acl jig you make your tunnel over the this is the medial meniscus root avulsion so you i am making my tunnel you can see here the, with the acl jig you pass to your four millimeter uh, your bit pin over that drill it with the four millimeter guide wire just i will make it fast you can see here now my i have passed my bit pin now i have, i am drilling and that's your curate acts like a protector so by this curate you are protecting any damage to the root tissue and once you make this for millimeter lower and again you pass your suture loop through this tunnel and park it in the anteromedial portal 
So you can see now I have passed my yellow thread and I park, I'm parking it in the anthromedial portal. Now, the next step is taking bite through the root tissue. And here also you can use this uh, suture passing device. You can see here there was some bone also attached with the root. There was some fibrous attachment of uh, the, uh, of this uh, bony tissue with the PCL fibers also. And when you are taking bite, take it away from the cartilage. You can see. And once you you take a bite, you can see here uh, it's a self retrieving device. So what I do normally, I use a, a two zero ortho cord or or, uh, or sometimes if you are not uh, having ortho cord, you can use two number three bond also. To uh, repair this room. So you can see here, now I have passed my ortho cord, and you can see it's a self retrieving device. Now take it through the antromedial portal, and once you take it to the antromedial portal, you have a loop there. You can just have a suture, and you can here you can see. Now, this is the loop technique. You, over that, you can put two or three half stitches to secure your loop. So you take a bite through whole of the meniscus root and uh, just uh, circum, uh, it's like a circumferential binding. And now with the knot pusher, put two or three half stitches over that. Now you load this purple wire over your uh, passing loop here, yellow wire. And once you load it and pull it anteriorly, you can see here. So the whole of the meniscus is sitting over the criteria. And this is very important step because you want to sit the meniscus over the raw area. And that is the reason we, we are focusing more on creating this crater for good meniscal root hearing. And now once your thread is anteriorly, you can push, uh, you can fix it with the post over a post, over a disc or over a, a endo button. Thank you. I think these are two small videos I, were, I have shared. Excellent, Rajiv. Thank you. So, uh, two quick questions. Uh, if you are doing an ACL reconstruction along with uh, your uh, root tear, what will be your sequence of making tunnels and uh, tightening and passing the sutures? So, that's first. And uh, how do you avoid pulling too much of tissue in your tunnel that you have made? Uh, am I clear with my question? Yes, so yes. Okay, okay. So, go ahead and answer. So, I, for the first thing is that when you are doing the ACL reconstruction, always, always try to make your meniscal tunnel first, pass your suture loop, go for yeah, and you can pass it over the anterior vesicular tibia. Just to park it over the and ask your assistant or you can hold it with the artery forcep. Now, make your TBL tunnel for ACL and femoral tunnel for ACL. Go for your ACL reconstruction. After your ACL has been reconstructed, you just, you can suture it over the post. Uh, over the antromedial aspect of the tibia. Second thing is that rewriting uh, whether the both the tunnel with polyid or not. See, you are acting on a different area. So try to make your ACL tunnel close to the tibial diversity and the meniscus uh, root tunnel over the uh, one centimeter medial do that when you are dealing with the medial meniscus. For lateral meniscus, you can have two tunnel, one over the medial, one medial to the tibial diversity, one lateral to the tibial diversity. That you can do. Regarding over tensing, what you have asked, Sudip, yes, it's a uh, definitely it's a question. Whenever you are getting type two repair, where you, the whole of the root, uh, there's a complete tear of the root. Here, there's every chance of over tensioning. But believe me, whenever you tie it, it over the uh, post, uh, over the anterior uh, medial aspect of the tibia, don't uh, uh, pull it so hard. Just pull it. See, whole of the meniscus is sitting over the crater. At that time, tie it, and I think that is the best way. Uh, of preventing over tensioning over the meniscus root tibia. Okay, perfect. Right. Perfect. Here, here yes, just sir. I make a one point yes, about please. the repair of root. So, regarding you have asked about the over tensioning, other things should be always kept in mind whenever you are repairing the root. First, you check with grasper whether your root is coming to the anatomical position what you have made for your tunnel. If it is not reaching and if you are pulling with the thread or your fiber tape, the chances of tear is very high Yes. and chances of failure is high. So if it is not coming there, then you should do some release at the menisco uh, capsular junction so that it's easily fall to its anatomical place. That is very important when repairing the root, particularly the chronic root. Okay. Thank you. And you take on this... I just want to add something more. Yeah, yeah please, Dr. Kush. Yeah, so uh, you can once again rely on Laparat to come up with newer techniques. So 
there's a good technique you described where there's a, a second tunnel made to centralize an extruded meniscus and that uh, is an indeed indeed a good idea so you take up uh, a stitch in the postero uh, medial corner in the medial meniscus uh, generally not required for lateral meniscus and you pull the meniscus in through uh, another tunnel and a second tunnel to hold the root in so that way you are saving your root in terms of repair once again the same question of mobility of the meniscus arises but if we consider that the root tear is similar to a total meniscectomy in terms of biomechanics you can accept some kind of meniscal stiffness but achieve healing of the meniscus by this technique so that's something we should all look at more seriously in extruded meniscus whether this technique will help in getting better and one more thing rajiv that is brilliant videos as usual from you uh, i moved away from using sutures and moved on to using tapes so what i yes, found yes. is that a suture tape or fiber tape or ultra tape which a company is is a material but tape gives a better surface area and the cinch knot doesn't slip through or cut through the meniscus so that's the only difference uh, uh, from what you showed but the technique you shown was exactly what I, how i would do as well thank you excellent uh, sarthak you raised your hand uh, you wanted to ask anything sarthak you have raised your hand uh, do you want to say you are on you are on mute sarthak unmute yourself unmute yourself uh, please yeah you still muted sarthak okay yeah uh, some uh, like i have a question sometimes while doing the root repair uh, i do you know when i try to uh, if after getting the reduction after the uh, like tightening i do like sometimes get the meniscus as a dog button it has happened to me one you know slight uh, maybe my tunnel because it was a tight knee i i think i did it uh, slightly more anterior and you know not exactly the footprint so uh, do you think i should go and rep- uh, mane once i get it intra up should i go and look for another tunnel or i can just forget about it just ask me in my curiosity rajiv yeah. i think dog ear is uh, uh, common when you are dealing with neglected ear but uh, arvind also told in such situation most of the time when you are repairing it so when you are pulling it also just see whether that is there or not it is over tensioning uh, the uh, meniscus then you can go for some release and that is recommended if you release i think you can get away with rather than putting a st- second tunnel in this root repair because most of the time you have to go with acl reconstruction also so yes. chances of tunnel collision is more if you have made a third tunnel so better to yeah. go with same tunnel and plan for some relief yeah what basically i use slide in the meanwhile sorry uh, sorry sarthak i mean you load your slides in the meanwhile okay sarthak go ahead yeah yes yeah, so what i do uh, like i use the flip cutter which we use for all inside technique so i pass the flip cutter and then open it and try to cure it instead of this uh, uh you know um, what do you say that uh, this curate instead of the curate i use this flip cutter only to remove the cartilage margin and then uh, that is why i feel like you no know, already there is a tunnel as you say dr rajiv to do one more tunnel i feel sometimes quite hesitation to kick or a tunnel yeah and how do maintain the pcl tunnel and the root tunnel how do take care of that normally both are quite different see root tunnels are at a higher level it's just below the posterior slope and pcl tunnel are usually 15 to 20 mm below the uh, tibial joint line so you usually most of the time it will not collide you are quite low for pcl tunnel and also we can if we change the jig angle it i think it won't i have never come most of the in. time most of the time it doesn't collide if you change the yeah. angle by 10 degree like what i see, yes correct 55 for acl or 55 to 60 and then 65 i keep for my root repairs and it doesn't matter where you come out from the tibia you can yeah, yeah. Uh, do a medial medial meniscus root tear and attach it to the button on the lateral side it doesn't make any difference mm. is the entry yes, point yes. of the meniscus root on in the joint which is more important where it comes out doesn't make any difference just make Rajiv sure sir that. one question yes about yes, degenerative root tears which we were discussing in the beginning be the last question before before yeah, i yeah. goes on for his presentation so degenerative yeah. tear i think if you uh, most of the people who have burned their finger by root repair these are degenerative tear because you don't get very good results in those cases so uh, degenerative tear try to balance it if it is coming inside your joint by pulling your probe sometime you can try but i think for degenerative tear root repair is not a good option for me bushan any comment on this degenerative root i think uh, hto first 
and then you think of a always always good have some yeah, good point by question yes yeah. yeah do we need do we need repair with the sto or only sto would do so if yeah, yeah. it's a degenerative tear which is more than a few weeks old i don't repair the root i just do sto and quite a few times as it been proven by various papers also if you go back in 6 months time that tear has already healed because your alignment is changed so i don't think you should repair a degenerate chronic uh, root tear if a, if a root tear is within 6 weeks of its injury it's worth repairing along with hto otherwise it's just going to fail again mostly the, those are not uh, traumatic actually so yeah, yeah, yeah. so just leave it okay yeah. healing is also not good leave so, it so just extension of this question which is more practical also i am facing almost at uh, once in a month so uh middle aged person 45 year to 50 year visited to the clinic with knee pain and as usual knee pain of 6 month duration x ray says it's grade 2 or maybe grade 3 type of problem uh, that uh, oa changes and usually uh, we ask for mri also and sometime patient comes with the mri that doctor see it's the meniscus tear and somebody recommended to you go to him so this 3 uh, to 4 month of pain uh, medial side pain with grade 2 oa changes with mri says it's the tear mostly most of the time i face it's horizontal tear and sometime this root tear it's not the complete root tear it's the partial one so bhushan sir how you differentiate this pain is because of whether it's the meniscal problem or whether it's because of the degenerative joint disease because until the pain is not because of degenerative joint disease this is not going to help with sto so how you differentiate this this is very practical one i faces almost one case in a month in grade 2 you can't do sto also you have to wait unless alignment is bad that's bhushan sir my approach to this is uh, so what i consider is a root tear is a part of the progression of arthritis and the disease process if you think of it in this way it, it clarifies a lot of lot of issues so as your arthritis is progressing a phase comes when your meniscus is pushed out and the root gives up and that's why you get a root tear now patients usually present with sudden onset of severe posterior medial pain with a complete root tear you do get uh, patients who have partial root tear or who are in the uh, natural history of the disease who are going to get a complete root tear i think if they are in varus if there are signs of overloading on the medial side if there is cartilage damage on the medial side i would still consider them for a hto if they are consistent with their history of loading pain night pain uh, and and typical activity associated pain on the other hand if i am in doubt i would try and use one of the unloader braces to try and get them offloaded on that side and see if they get better or not i think uh, yeah. it's virtually impossible to differentiate a degenerate joint pain and pain which is coming from partial root tear in my opinion yeah usually i do the same offloaded brace for 2 mm-hmm. to 3 month and look uh, whether it's getting relief or not thank you yeah. so should i start yes arvind yes, please yes, go sir. yeah so uh, the my topic is uh, meniscal ramp lesion which is uh, very common Uh, now it is because of uh, this finding uh, orthoscopist uh, finding this lesion very commonly particularly with the acl injury so ramp lesion originally uh, it was described that it's the menisco capsular junction horizontal tear longitudinal tear in the posterior horn of the medial meniscus but uh, now it is discussion is that it's not so a strong a structure that menisco capsular junction is not so a strong a structure so this a structure is not so very a strong so uh, the consideration of the menisco tibial ligament through which the posterior horn of medial meniscus attaches to the tibia which is the strongest one also taken into this ramp lesion this is the earlier part so mechanism is well described very long time ago by hickston when the knee is in flexion in around 90 degree it is the contraction of the semi membranosus which pulls the capsule from the meniscus and that leads to development of this type of lesion that is the ramp lesion so usually this ramp lesion is associated with acl injury uh, 
either it may be acute one or it may be chronic one. When the knee is in valgus, there is anterior subluxation of the tibia that leads to the tear of the ACL. And as ACL torn, the tibia moves further anteriorly. And this leads to the contraction of the semimembranous, which attaches posteriorly on the medial side. And extension of this attachment also goes to the capsule. So further uh, uh, anterior translation of the tibia with the tear of ACL and anterolateral ligament, this semimembranous contracts. And this leads to the developments of this ramp lesion. So about the ramp lesion exploration, so it's this lesion is also call, called as the hidden lesion or missed lesion, very well described by the Sonri Kote in American Journal of Sports Medicine. And he says, your scope should be in posteromedial gutter first, then at the border of uh, posteromedial portal, you uh, pass your needle and do the probing of your capsule as well as the meniscus. Like here, we can see the first, you pass your scope in the posteromedial gutter. And then from the posteromedial portal side, you pass the needle and do the probing of this capsule as well as the meniscus and look for, is there any separation or not? So similarly, uh, practically also, this is the femur PCL, you enter into the posteromedial gutter with your scope. Then you pass the needle and then you may uh, probe here or also if you confirm that your uh, this ramp lesion is very clear with your uh, uh, MRI finding, then you can make a uh, portal and do the probing of this part. And with the increasing knowledge of all these anatomy, the classification has been given for it. This is the normal attachment of the capsule with the meniscus. And this is the meniscus and this is the tibia. And so this is the meniscotibial ligament. So type one, this is the tear in the meniscocapsular part, particularly the synovial sheath. The second type is the partial superior. It's the only partial, it's not reaching to the inferior surface and it's in the meniscus body, peripheral part. Similarly, the partial inferior is type three. It's not reaching to the superior part. And then type four is complete in the peripheral part of the meniscus. And type five is the double tear. The same thing you can see here also in this video. This is lesion in the, uh, the capsular part. The meniscus is uh, clear. And here orthoscopically, if you see, this is the capsular part, which is torn. And from here, you can see the tibia also. So this is type one. So next is the type two. This is the partial superior part in the body of the meniscus in the most peripheral part. So this is only in the upper part, superior part. Usually it is taken as the stable one. Similarly, the partial inferior, which you can probe from the anterior side. And if it's come anteriorly, then it means it's there. And when you remove the tissue from the posterior medial gutter, then this become complete. So similarly, uh, the another type three part, you can pull it into the joint. So it's unstable type. And when you place your uh, scope into the posterior medial gutter and with the help of needle, if you just do the probing, so this, uh, the scar tissue will get away and your, uh, the ramp lesion become very clear. Type four is the complete uh, meniscal tear just in the peripheral part. So this is the meniscal tissue, which is tear from the main uh, meniscus in the posteriorly and type five is the double uh, tear, complete tear. So this is the one type one, uh, one tear, this is the another tear. So this is the type five. So with all these classification, the treatment uh, part is that it should be repaired if it is unstable and repairing should be done from the posterior medial portal, lasso uh, through the cannula and then put the stitch there. And it's uh, depending upon the size of the tear, it's maybe one stitch, two stitch or three stitch. 
so uh, so that it's become a stable one and the from posteriorly it's complete uh, close to the meniscus so this 17 year male boy presented to us at the four week of the injury the mri says the complete acl tear and also there is problem with the posterior part of the medial meniscus and the with sensitivity and specificity this separation of the meniscus uh, capsule from the meniscus having the highest sensitivity and specificity you can see this separation there is uh, uh, there is in reporting there may be irregularity or edema but this separation is the most commonly taken as the ramp lesion mri wise so uh, this uh, again uh, a scope in the posterior medial portal needle is there look for check for this uh, ramp lesion so with the knife portal was made then the probe was passed and you can see this much of separation of this uh, the ramp lesion and going from there to there so this much of the separation was there so through the cannula this lasso was passed initially the standard lasso i use but nowadays there is ramp lasso is also available so this is and this is suture was passed over this lasso part and the suturing is that that is the sliding knot through this uh, cannula and this is there and you can compress the tissue with the help of knot pusher and the since tear was big then another uh, the suturing was planned in the similar fashion and the second stitch was placed that is uh, the posterior to the capsular part so that your uh, tissue get as much as closer to the meniscus so these two stitches are there and this uh, closer of this uh, ramp lesion was done the second case this was the chronic acl getting managed with the rehab recently having recurrent uh, locking type of sensation it's not complete lock but having symptom of locking for last two months so plan for the acl reconstruction mri was clear only acl tear was there but with the history of recurrent locking in the back of mind this posterior medial corner should be explored mri was absolutely fine there was no problem and you can see there is rent is there and this tissue is not very good so this chronic type of acl usually this menisco capsular part is also get injured with the time and when you probe it this uh, lesion will get bigger so though it's very small but tissue was not very good and the chances of further injury is high so repair was planned and with the single suture this get close so third case uh, again uh, the fresh case injury uh, uh, six week old only the uh, again a scope in the posterior medial gutter with the probe uh, in the ramp lesion this is with the 30 degree scope so when you use the 70 degree scope so this much of the weing area will find so many recommends that for the ramp lesion you can use the 70 degree will give the better visualization nowadays i am using 70 degree for all my ramp repair so again big uh, tear is there so a similar suturing was this is the first uh, knot and then at the second knot again outside the uh, capsule so some recent literature over this this is uh, in 2018 uh, uh, this uh, American Journal of Sports Medicine, the biomechanical study. What is the effect of this? And the conclusion was the effect of ramp lesion was it increases the anterior tibial translation. So many a time, this type of patient will have grade three anterior dorsal tears, as well as the grade three pivot shift also. In spite of being there is no any other injury, only ramp and ACL will lead to such type of clinical finding. And those who are not uh, re uh, repair uh, for the ramp, only isolated ACL reconstruction was done. The pivot shift was uh, still there. And those who are uh, repair, uh, the pivot shift was uh, uh, absent. Though, however, this literature says the effect of this change was minimal, but its statistically significance was found. But the clinical significance remained unclear. It was the biomechanical study. Again, research paper in 2020 the, about the healing status after uh, uh, this stability. 
So healing rate of ramp lesion was significantly better in each those who are having repair in comparison to those who have not repaired. It means some cases those who have been not repaired get healed. So such type of uh, finding should be uh, decided uh, orthoscopically, particularly with extension when your uh, the flap get uh, close, then such type of the lesion having potential for healing. Even with the extension, this flap don't get closes, then the chances of healing such type with this ramp lesion is less. Anterior laxity in the knee in which ramp lesion was unhealed was significantly greater. So unhealed ramp lesion having higher anterior laxity in comparison to those in which the ramp lesion was healed. And the final conclusion was all inside repair through the posteromedial portal was a reliable surgical procedure and, and this helped in the healing of ramp lesion. Thank you. Excellent uh, talk, Arvin. Nice presentation. All right. So uh, we have uh, any any questions? Uh, some sort of anything that has come up on? Yeah, Vivek will. No, not, not questions yet. Okay. No questions yet. Vivek, Dr. Vivek, uh, what is your uh, post op rehab for the ramp repair? So usually and, it's uh, I usually I and, keep and one 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 minute. Sir. At what knee position you tie or not? It's the 90 degree always. And uh, I usually keep non bed bearing for six weeks. And range of motion only 90 degree, not more than 90 degree for initial four weeks. So this was the thing I was uh, discussing about the circumferential compression stitches. This, this was the tear having vertical as well as horizontal tear also. So the vertical part was removed and this, uh, the circumferential suture was passed and this was tight and the knot, uh, usually I try to place posteriorly, but even it's remain anteriorly, this gets synovalized with the time. So another suture and this is the another. So these three sutures give very a strong configuration that the novel stitch recently come. Initially, I used to do with the meniscal, uh, this uh, Arthrex company, this meniscal suturing device. Okay. Yeah. And nowadays, this Smith nephew having mini scorpion also. First pass minute. Yeah, so first pass minute. Uh, Arvind, uh, you find uh, uh, these lesions and uh, in your practice, uh, do you think that you might have missed or some, most of us who have not been looking specifically for these lesions may have missed and that would have led to a bad outcome in our ACL reconstruction. You take on it and then Bhushan, you take on this and then followed yeah. by and Rajiv. Yes. Yeah, I started doing ramp lesion for last four years only. Before that, I was not aware of the lesion, I truly speaking. Right. So. Okay. Clinical in clinical examination, if you find something like bucket handle, patient is having bucket handle tear and sudden it's get locked, then get released. But or, uh, MRI wise, there is no bucket handle tear. So such type of clinical finding along with the grade three anterior dot test positive is suggestive of ramp lesion. Whenever I find there is excessive excer excursion of the tibia while there anterior dot test, I always look for this uh, posteromedial cor uh, corner. And the incidence of ramp lesion is increasing every year. Initially, it was 6%. Nowadays, it's almost 25% of the cases, those who have been ACL tear. Okay. So definitely, it's having effect on this uh, ACL reconstruction also with the time, because we have seen literature says the pivoting is uh, still persists, and that is not very good for reconstructed ACL. Thank you. It can be because of anterolateral ligament as well. The yeah. Can I just, yeah, okay. sorry, go ahead. Yeah, Bhusan, sir. Yeah. yeah, so I'll just tell you a quick uh, small story. Uh, till 2012, uh, uh, we did not know anything about ramp repair. I visited uh, Sonari Kote Bertrand in, in uh, Lyon in 2012, and he talked about the hidden lesion of the knee. Till that time, every patient with pivot shift used to get either a 
uh, lateral uh, tenodesis, either Lemaire or Macintosh in our hands. So uh, this changed suddenly. We found about 20% of patients who actually had a pivot shift test did not have an anterolateral injury, but it was a diagonally opposite area, the posterior medial corner, which had the ramp tear. So ramp tear is also associated with pivot shift test, and we didn't know that till that time. The incidence is around 20%. In our practice now, it's almost a one in five, one in four patients get a ramp repair associated with the meniscal posterior repair. So it's either type three or type uh, four kind of uh, a ramp tear. So it's very common to do a ramp repair nowadays. And uh, every patient that has an ACL tear, make sure that you go in the hiatus between the PCL and the med medial femoral condyle to assess the posterior, uh, posterior medial capsular junction, the ramp area, to and assess clinically, make sure it's uh, not torn. Uh, every time, probe it properly and make sure that you're not missing a ramp lesion. Because we are trying our best to reduce the uh, re-rupture rate following ACL and these are all small uh, missing pieces of puzzle like the ALL or lateral tenodesis or a, a posterior medial corner injuries. So all of these are small, small have contributions to the uh, ACL success. So I think it's yes, important sir. to uh, not miss all of these injuries. Okay, excellent point. Uh, Rajiv, anything you want to add uh, to this? Or I think Rajiv diagnostic to... roundup yeah, diagnostic round of what we used to do starting from suprapetal approach, now you have to go into posterior medial corner also so that you don't miss the ramp lesion. But in fresh cases, usually you get this ramp lesion. Whenever you are getting in old cases, you, you will not get it. And I, I think it's better if you see it, repair it, but don't try to, I don't follow those studies where people do needling of the posterior medial corner and just create a, see whether that tear is there or not. I think those tear usually helps well with the rehabilitation. So if you see if tear, its tear is there with SLP and go for a ramp repair and SLP reconstruction, the results are quite good. Okay, so we have two questions coming up uh, online. Uh, Romesh, I'd like to, you to take these questions. So the first one is, uh, hashtag repair supposed to be the strongest repair for radial tear. Have you used this pattern or simple transverses enough? So in your opinion, what is the best uh, pattern of repair for a radial tear? You, I think you have mentioned it, but if you can just reiterate the facts again. Uh, the there, was, uh, there was a study which, uh, which I showed in a slide. It, it Probably in 2012, it was published in a journal, which uh, the hashtag repair is the same, which prevents the rip stop. I mean, it's kind of a rip stop that we do for rotator cuff. So that they found it is the strongest uh, uh, repair that you can give in radial tears specifically. Uh, uh, so it, it depends on what you, what you are well versed with. So if you if you if you have in your armentari armentarium, if you have those devices which you can use to get the hashtag repair or the Pratt repair, it's called. So you can go with that. Otherwise, if you are comfortable with the if if it's a small tear and you are comfortable with the just a, a, pos a position of the tear margins with a simple horizontal stitches, then also you can probably uh, prevent the consequences. So okay. definitely it is stronger, but if you cannot do it, go with whatever you, whatever is in your hands, whatever you are comfortable with. Right. Okay. And another question, I think uh, Rajiv can answer this question. Uh, the question is that uh, for concomitant ACL and posterior root medial meniscus tear, is it advisable to use high and lateral portal as described by Freddie Fu, one centimeter lateral to patella tendon at the level of inferior hole of patella. So what are your... Uh, portals, Raji, when you have a concomitant ACL and posterior root medial meniscus tear, do you change your portal slightly or uh, how, how do you approach with your portals basically? Yeah, high portals are always, I think for routine ACL also, if you are not dealing with root, I make it high portal because it's close to the inferior portal of the patella because that makes my life easy uh, because most of the fat pad I can avoid in making the high lateral portal. It's not like for the root repair or for some special reason I'm using it. It's a normal routine portal I use. It's a high lateral portal. Okay. But yes, medially you should have two portal because in anteromedial and accessory medial because in one portal you will park your passing loop and another portal you will take your back. So, so basically medially you should have medial root tear uh, you don't do anything uh, out of the ordinary yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a normal, normal portal. Yeah. yeah. Bhushan, you take on this. Uh, can you just enlighten? I think there's an unusual combination. Medial meniscus root tear is not that common with ACL injuries. It's the lateral meniscus posterior tear, which is more common. But mm -hmm. uh, you can have as many portals as you want. 
Uh, yes. The important thing is not to mess up your surgery and not to be uncomfortable with your suture placement or your portal placement, not to accept yes, yes. the suboptimal result. So uh, no one will question if you have four portals uh, on the medial side. But every other question, you if you get the root uh, repair in the non-anatomical position. So I think it's, uh, that's immaterial. Immaterial, okay. Excellent. I don't think we have any other question coming up on the forum. So uh, if faculty uh, want to put up uh, moderate, uh, any question for any of the speakers, let's uh, quickly take one or two questions before we wrap up our session tonight. We have already two hours down the line. Yeah, Roman, you have been... uh, one point to make in uh, bucket handle uh, tear repairs. If you go for the, I mean, uh, I, I, I uh, actually uh, saw this in my practice. If you go for a horizontal stitch first, then sometimes as you put your pull out your first stitch, the it, yeah. it comes into the notch. So it's it's better if you are initially starting, you take a vertical stitch first. That probably fixes the the complete meniscus to the posterior part, and then you can go with the horizontal repair. So just a point to make for bucket handles. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. Starting it right. Cinching is more with the vertical mattress than the horizontal mattress. Actually. But so sometimes, if you want cost-effective repair horizontal mattress, you can come out with horizontal mattress. So One, just like, yeah, yeah Doctor Bhushan. Okay, one important thing for bucket handle tears is to take sutures on the under surface of the meniscus. All the mm -hmm. all inside devices are normally designed to take uh, uh, stitches or uh, or uh, incorporate the top of the meniscus. Now, if we if you are, if you remember the talk about the anatomy of the meniscus, the meniscus is closely attached to the tibia. So that's why if you use inside out, you can easily go under the meniscus and tether it down to the tibia with the menisco tibial ligament much better. I'm not brave enough to go to the posterior of lateral meniscus. But everywhere else, I would use more often an inside out device. So, uh, sutures inside out rather than going for all inside devices as far as possible. Yes, I agree, a vertical suture is much better to tether the meniscus in the posterior medial corner. But try and take vertical sutures on the under surface of the meniscus so the meniscus doesn't lift up like that and doesn't salute you mm -hmm. every time you go inside, it stays and stays snug to the tibia. So just uh, sharing my experience, why I does what I does in this bucket handle, just I put first the inside odd suture. I don't tie that. One of the my assistant keep pulling it, so your meniscus reduce it it in place. And when you are using all inside suture anchor, this will not get displaced. So this only one suture that is inside odd, which anatomically reduce it. This will not allow the uh, the torn meniscal part to come in the intercondylar part and also it not allow the either it's the tilting of the meniscus when you are putting this all inside uh, suturing device. Thank you. The question that has come up uh, from a first year postgraduate is that uh, why you have to repair the meniscus while doing uh, ACL reconstruction? Avinash, would you like to take this question? Uh, yeah. Unmute yourself, Avinash. Yeah. Just quick answer why you have why the need to repair the meniscus while doing ACL reconstruction. Uh, apart from uh, all those things like uh, good healing due to BMPs and the stem cells and about osteoarthritis and the recurrent uh, meniscus tear, I want to stress on one point that we should not forget that meniscus is a secondary restraint to anterior translation. So when your ACL is torn, it's a meniscus which gives us a secondary stabilization to anterior translation. So if we prepare a meniscus uh, with a ACL reconstruction, we are giving a good benefit of a better support, better uh, support of a healing to a ACL, a new ACL ligament. And in concordance, that, that will help a better healing with a meniscus. So we should always remember that meniscus is a secondary stabilizer to anterior translation and also to the external and internal rotations. So that will be a very helpful if you do a meniscus repair but that will give a better biomechanics to a good ACL reconstruction. Okay. Very rightly summed up uh, the gist of why we try and repair meniscus more and more with ACL reconstruction. Okay. If there is uh, anything else uh, that somebody wants to add or add the add something, otherwise we'll uh, yes. hand it over. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock we should. <laughs> yeah. Arvind, Arvind uh, if you can uh, just quickly uh, wrap up uh, the thing and uh, before that i'll thank uh, bhushan uh, for moderating and uh, all the other speakers and all the 
panelists who are here with us tonight. And, and well done to Sudeep also for moderating the whole thing really well. Yeah. <laughs> so, hats off to you. And the quality of presentation Sorry. has been really, really, really good. Excellent. I was really happy with all the talks and it was really good to uh, brush up and have a good discussion with all of our old friends like you. Thank you all. Yeah. So, Arvin, you and then Madhusudan, uh, Dr. Madhusudan uh, to finish up the job of thanking everyone. Uh, Arvin, you please first. Yeah. Uh, it was great discussion all about the meniscus and thank you all the speaker accepting the invitation in very short time and making this uh, webinar very uh, academic one. Thank you. Madhusudan uh, was... Uh, yeah. oh, you have to unmute yourself, uh, doc uh, Dr. Madhusudan, yes. Thank you, Dr. Sudeep. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for their time and efforts. It was a very educative and interactive session. Uh, there is discussion done about all about the meniscus, like the anatomy and uh, minister, minister, Tommy versus repair, menis, meniscus repair, these different videos. So it is, I hope it was very beneficial for all the blooming doctors in our association and all over the country. I would like to thank our moderator, panelists, and all the speakers like the Dr. Ajiv Raman, Dr. Bhushan, Dr. Sudeep Kumar, Dr. Nirad Sridhastav, Dr. Vipra Prasad Gupta, Dr. Akesh Chaudhary, Dr. Prabhat Prakash from Bihari, Dr. Manish, Dr. Amesh Gaur, Dr. Sarthak, Dr. Rajiv Ranga, Dr. Vivek and Dr. Avinas, all the board members, all the audience and Output TV, especially the Dr. Samsul Hoda, is a convener of ITO Bihar Orthopedic Association. And I thanks to all of you. Boa is always with the Bihar Orthopedics, the Bihar Orthoplasty Society. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Yes. Good night, everyone. Stay safe. And thank you thank once you. again, Ortho TV, for excellent uh, uh, managing this session. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Stay safe. Good, good night. night. Thank you. Good thank night. You. Thank you. Good night. Stay safe. Stay safe. Good night, Robin Boss. Good thank night, you. Sudeep. Good night. Good night, everyone. Ramesh, everybody. Thank you. Thank Bye. you, everyone. Bye, Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Ramesh. Thank Bye. you. Bye, Boss. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone. <clears throat>